So I changed the title. Actually, it's high throughput phase retriever. And uh, but yeah, uh, sorry. Pronunciation wise, uh, Stefano Marchesini. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, everyone does that. Don't worry. Uh, so I recently moved to LCLS, actually last week. So uh, some, uh, I'm gonna, I changed my talk a little. Uh, so LCLS is a X-ray laser. Uh, there was a talk about using X-ray laser, but uh, you haven't heard much. So I'll do a, little, a brief uh, discussion about light sources and um, then uh, go on to uh, the prob some problems in phase retrieval, mostly. Um, so, uh, we heard a lot of talks about uh, uh, using different sources, uh, but uh, so, for example, what you ha get with an X-ray laser, like uh, LCLS, which was the first X-ray, hard X-ray laser, uh, and it was the brightest source in the world for a while, and uh, it's an uh, ongoing uh, an upgrade that is going to put it back on top. These things keep on getting racing each other. So it's about a, a billion, almost a billion time higher peak brightness, and uh, and uh, not so much in the average brightness because the the pulse rate is not as high. But uh, with a new upgrade upgrade of LC, with the LCLS2, it's going to be I don't know, big uh, big gain uh, in. Um, uh, a, a number of photons. Uh, so the LCLS2, which is coming online soon, uh, it was delayed a bit due to the pandemic. Um, it's a big upgrade where the wrap rate of the Linux, uh, so this, sorry, this, the machine is uh, at the, on the Slack. Uh, campus, which is near Stanford, next to Stanford. Next to Stanford, and it's uh, this big building, which is a mile long or something like that, two miles maybe. And uh, it used to be the longest building in the world before LIGO. Uh, it goes under the freeway. There's a big accelerator, then, the accel then uh, it goes um, and produces x-rays in an undulator. Uh, the brightness. Uh, keeps going up. Uh, some, uh, so what happens with uh, these are some examples of experiments that happen there uh, at LCLS. Uh, it, the users come and do an experiment, they move on. So there is keep they keep on changing experiments. And these are some experiments that happen there. And these are some of the data rates that are expected um, uh, or that are happening now. And it's uh, they are a little bit frightening. Uh, so. It, so they are going to be, well, in terms of data rate, uh, and uh, also in terms of computational uh, effort. For example, uh, one of the most popular techniques that we uh, pioneered um, more than 10 years ago. Uh, at the time, I was at Livermore, but I, I, I did participate in these experiments. We did the, do these experiments. Uh, so what you have is um, you spray a nanocrystal, uh, spray crystals, hit them with the X-ray laser, collect diffraction patterns, orient the diffraction patterns, then uh, apply crystallographic methods and reconstruct. So what was happening before is that you had about 60 gigabytes per second. Uh, a lot of the data was empty, so you could just throw away most of it, fortunately. And then, so the uh, data rate actually is reduced a lot. Um, and then, uh, uh, so this thing was, manageable, but as we go, move on to the next uh, upgrade, it's going to be one terabyte a second, or like a, pet, a few peta, a few petabytes per hour. And uh, so we have to, uh, so in the group, in the, the new group that I'm in, we have to worry about this. Thanks. Um, but I just started last week, so I haven't done much. But so anyway, then, uh, so the standard classical phase retrieval that we are uh, uh, with the uh, standard method, uh, like a diffractive imaging the, where, that this workshop is all about. Uh, you have an X-ray source or a source. You hit a sample, collect the Fourier transform amplitude, and then you have to find the reconstruction. And there has been a lot of work in this. Uh, there, is, there was a paper in uh, five years ago where. Uh, by Russell Luke in, uh, 
in the SIAC uh, group, optimization group, uh, where it shows that uh, there has been, I don't know, I did the, uh, the number of papers in phase of three is almost three per day. According, to, like, if you if you divide how many papers there have been, no, it's, a lot of them are applications of phase three, uh, no, about algorithms. But uh, anyway, uh, there are many different situations where uh, you do um, different types of diffraction and then try to reconstruct. It's not always reconstructing a a. Sing, a single object. Uh, so, uh, often it's uh, either uh, uh, an ab uh, crystal or um, uh, different uh, things. So, uh, for example, there is a single particle diffraction where you have a, a particle. It can be a biological cell or a, anything. It has to be isolated. Uh, but then there is nanocrystallography, which I just showed. You have micro where you want to find the, uh, not so much the atomic uh, order, but which crystal is where. Uh, people then do also scanning diffraction, which is tachography, basically. Or uh, people also study small molecules. They, they, they do use different algorithms to study these, even though the this experimental setup are fairly similar. You put your sample in, collect photons that come out, and try to gather as much information about your sample. So small molecules are solved uh, mostly by direct methods. Uh, uh, but I mean, in principle, they could use the problems are similar. So sometimes the people don't talk to each other, don't know each other's algorithm, and uh, so. But uh, so they they use the different algorithms. And you have people that study powder crystals, protein crystals. Or solution scattering. Solution scattering is fairly difficult because you have randomly oriented particles, proteins in solution, and you collect uh, an average diffraction pattern, a radially average diffraction pattern. But somehow, magically, they can still get at least uh, some uh, low resolution information about this protein. So now, uh, crystallography has been around for uh, more than a hundred years. The initial, uh, the initial samples were fairly simple, just salt. Then uh, more complicated DNA. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the diffraction pattern was only well, had very limited information, and they, they used uh, also stereochemical information to figure out what the structure was. But the, the diffraction pattern by Rosalind Franklin was critical to uh, figuring out what it was. Then uh, later on, RNA, and then people keep going and going. Uh, there has been uh, 200,000 proteins solved so far, uh, and uh, these are very active. I mean, it's still an active, um, a very active. For example, uh, as soon as the COVID uh, pandemic started, all the light sources uh, started looking at the uh, these proteins. I mean, the, all the labs shut down except for the protein crystallography beam lines that were uh, at, in charge of figuring out the structure of the uh, COVID, all the spike proteins. And uh, the reason why we know this, the pro the, these COVID structures uh, was uh, because of all the light sources. This, as an example, this is Brookhaven. I just found on the web by all the light sources of uh, the US and around the world, they, they were looking at uh, these things. But anyway, uh, back to uh, the classical phase of river. Uh, so the standard method, or the most, uh, the one that is most uh, described, is uh, the alternating projection method. Uh, people call this, often call this um, the Gersberg-Sakton algorithm. Uh, but this uh, gersberg sakton algorithm is, uh, was a very specific version of this, where the real space constraint was uh, measured amplitudes. So normally, uh, uh, at least in the optics, the optics people don't call uh, the, uh, all these uh, generalized uh, alternating projection um, gersberg sakton uh, and alternative projection is a method that exists, has existed since uh, at least 100 years, for Neumann and before. Um, but one method where 
Uh, this uh, is quite popular, uh, is typographic imaging. Uh, we heard a lot about typographic imaging. Um, so what you do is uh, you have uh, illumination, you scan the sample, collect diffraction patterns at each point, and uh, you um, try to recover uh, the reconstruction, uh, the, the, the object based on this diffraction pattern. So you the advantage here is that you have a lot of redundancy in your measurement. So in terms of, sorry for the animation, it wasn't intended. Uh, so the, 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 the optical setup is like this. You have a, a sample that you hit with an illumination, uh, which you, we describe with uh, some uh, probe uh, that will uh, restrict the, a piece of the object. And then you do a Fourier transform, compute the absolute value, and that's your measurement. And now you, what you have to do is find, find, uh, what is it? find the, uh, the sample. And sometimes you also have to find the illumination. Uh, so, sorry about that. So the, there, there has been uh, over the years many uh, several many algorithms. Uh, so basically, what you have is an overdetermined problem where you have a low dimensional space, and you have a large high dimensional data. And what you do is typically you have uh, this either alternating projection or some variance where uh, you fit data and you fit the model in a split, like a kind of a split uh, algorithm, which either alternating the projection. Uh, method is uh, quite popular. Actually, people, one of the most popular is the alternative projection where you update uh, each frame at a time, but uh, which is called EPI. But it's actually, my experience, all the papers I've seen, it's not the most efficient. It produces worse results, and uh, it's not easily parallelizable. So I'm not sure why it's still popular. But people always compare with the with this and. Uh, uh, somehow it's the gold standard, but uh, I, I'm not a fan. But anyway, so th there is a alternative projection, which is kind of the like uh, the simplest you can think of. Then there is um, uh, RAR, which is now actually RAR, RAR, the the one who proposed RAR now calls it um, relaxed Douglas Rashford algorithm. He, uh, so it's a better uh, description of the. Uh, 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 it refers to the uh, old uh, Douglas Rashford algorithm from the uh, 1950s. Then there is, uh, like more recently, alternating direction method of multipliers, uh, difference map, HIO, and so on. Then, of course, you can apply various. We, I mean, we implemented various uh, uh, square methods like conjugate gradient, Newton, CG Newton, and so on. This is fairly old, uh, like more than 10 years ago. Uh, also, yeah, with uh, also Newton computing all the Wirtinger uh, calculus uh, are the Hessians uh, of the problem. Uh, and then uh, uh, spectrum methods. Now, with, when you have to do with uh, actual experimental data, you have all these other extra, extra additional problems that you have to deal with, apart from the phase retrieval. Typically, you also don't quite know the illumination very well. And you have some partial coherence, which smooths out, smooths out your diffraction patterns. And uh, you have typically have some background in your detectors, position errors, outliers, uh, spikes, uh, cosmic rays hitting your detectors, drifts. Uh, uh, then you want to do everything fast, uh, and uh, so on. Also, uh, then you want to do tomography uh, and spectral tachography. So we have. Uh, uh, a long list of papers about uh, all these problems. You can go and look on uh, Google Scholars and so on. But the thing I wanted to uh, focus now is the following problem that was, uh, uh, I asked a question to Chris uh, yesterday when he was um, showing that, yeah, okay, if you have a large, the problem is here that if you have a large data set, 
It's true that you can uh, just scale up the forward problem, forward simulation of your uh, uh, experiment uh, fairly linearly, almost linearly with your data size. I mean, you have the n log n from the uh, each frame, but it, it scales linearly with the number of frames. So if your problem is, it gets large, the, the forward simulation scales linearly with the number of frames. But the problem is the convergence rate does not. So here, for example, um, uh, if you have a very small data set with eight by eight frames, it converges really fast. But if you have uh, uh, more frames, the convergence rate actually drops quite dramatically. And the, and the motivation for this is quite simple, is that if you, at each iteration, whether you do, uh, uh, well, if you do first, any first order method, basically, uh, at each iteration, one frame communica uh, communicates with the next frame, and by the and uh, so it takes. If you have many frames far apart, a thousand frames far apart, before the first frame can co make any communication with the last frame, it takes a thousand iterations. So uh, that is an issue. Now a little more notation uh, of the pre of. Um, the experiment. So you have this um, uh, measured amplitudes, and you have this um, Fourier transform of the frames, and the, the frames are basically extracted with this matrix S, which uh, restricts the a piece of the sample. Now, if you look at uh, what happens to each frame. Uh, so what you have is that if a frame is overlapping with the other frame, then uh, uh, when, uh, when you take uh, one frame, you uh, shift it and multiply it by, by the illumination, it must equal, be equal to the other frame shifted uh, the opposite way, multiplied by the other illumination. So if you take the diff, the, all, the, all the pairs of frames that are overlapping, you, you must have this, um, um, this equation satisfied. So basically that gives you some kind of uh, graph that describes the, the connection between all the frames. Now, if you have uh, some other pairs of frames, uh, you get a, a diagonal term, uh, you get a diagonal term, and you get a um, Hermitian term, and uh, outside uh, you, you multiply the frames, the, the uh, block of uh, the group of frames. And so what you have to do is minimize that uh, function, so that all the you minimize the pairwise the sum of all the pairwise difference between all the frames. So, like if you. If you exclude or forget about the illumination itself, um, for example, you have two frames that are overlapping, and you want to, and let's say that you reconstructed them perfectly, but there is a, a phase factor multiplying each frame that is different. And now you want to, uh, so a phase factor is a scalar factor, uh, which with amplitude one. So what you have to do is minimize the, the pairwise difference between the two pairs of frames after you shift them properly and uh, find the common region. So what you, uh, you minimize this term, what you have is a, a term that is constant and a term that depends on the dot product between the pairs of frames. And so what you, when you minimize this, you maximize the, that term, and that means uh, you find the phase of, the conjugate of the pairs of, of, pairs of frames, and that is what uh, will minimize the uh, the pairwise difference between these two frames. Now, if you're doing the, uh, for many frames, you minimize the sum of all the frames, this uh, ends up being, uh, you have two terms that are constant, that are the sum of all the amplitudes of all the frames, and or the norms of all the frames, and mi minus the, the pairwise product between the, uh, the pairs of frames uh, shifted uh, so that they overlap. So what you do is you you have to uh, you have to maximize this term, and so. But in principle, this is um, uh, 
now it's a, a vector of uh, phases that multiplies each frame. And uh, what you have to do is you have to maximize uh, this um, uh, product with the, the inside the, you have this um, uh, matrix, Hermitian matrix, that is the uh, pairwise product between all the pairs of frames. And so when you, uh, so this is basically, you find the largest eigenvalue of this uh, term, and that is what, instead of, so you relax the fact that this is a phase, and you just maximize this as, for a vector, and then you enforce the fact that it's a phase afterward. And so you find the largest eigenvalue, eigen, uh, the large, the principal eigen vector, and then uh, normalize to get all the frames. So if you look at, uh, this is uh, what I call phase synchronization. So if you look at, for example, the RAR algorithm, and you do the regular uh, reconstruction, you see that the convergence rate uh, drops dramatically. Uh, if you apply the synchronization step at each iteration, the convergence rate starts to behave better. Um, now, the same applies if you're doing um, conjugate gradient. Uh, you can do synchro conjugate uh, at each conjugate gradient iteration. Uh, you get a similar thing. Now, later, uh, working with uh, uh, Yuan Ni from UC Davis, who is sitting here. <laughs> uh, uh, we uh, studied the problem of whether the, the, you could uh, split this and uh, have uh, do the synchronization in pieces and in multi-stage. So you synchronize pieces, then uh, uh, synchronize, uh, synchronize tile, uh, within a tile, a small region, and then synchronize a, a long, among the different tiles. And you can see sometimes you get a better convergence. The same thing happens when you have a, a position retrieval. So if you have a slow drift also, uh, if you have to find the position of all the frames, you have an error, then uh, you also want to optimize that. And uh, if you have a slow drift, you have to solve the similar uh, large scale problem of all the positions. The problem is if you're doing the optimization frame by frame, um, it's uh, it takes a long time because uh, if the if the position discrepancies are random, it's fine. But if there is a correlation between neighboring frames, then it doesn't work so well. So what you have to do is again optimize the uh, minimize the pairwise difference between all frames, and the scaling of this uh, works uh, a lot better. Uh, well, the the so basically. You have to uh, apply a Taylor. You apply a Taylor expansion of all the illuminations for each frame. Then you minimize the discrepancy among all the frames. And then, uh, so that what you do is you take the derivative with respect to this uh, shift, and then minimize that. You get big uh, some uh, product between all pairs of frames. Uh, form a large linear system equation, solve for that, and um, that will uh, speed up your convergence. I don't have a picture of that, but uh, it works uh, quite well. Uh, now this example of so the, what we were doing, how it works in an experiment, actually, after a while, after a big effort of putting all this into run a multi-GPU nodes and attaching this to the detector and, and uh, so on, we were able to finally, basically, in almost real time with a small latency, uh, send it, like take diffraction patterns, send them to the um, uh, um, a cluster that was first polishing the frames, then uh, iterating. Uh, so first polishing the frames, then sending it to, to an iterative engine that was doing the reconstruction as the frames started getting there. And meanwhile, also optimizing uh, the illuminations. Uh, other thing to, that you can use to speed up is to, uh, if you have a fixed detector with a certain number of pixels, you want to optimize your illumination. So uh, what is the best illumination? Well, in, uh, in um, 
for tachography, you want an illumination that is large because uh, you illuminate a bigger spot and then you can make bigger, bigger uh, steps. Uh, so for uh, the one I proposed is some kind of a random illumination. Uh, in uh, real space and in Fourier space, it, it'll also kind of random, but it has to be made by a, it has to have a finite width, otherwise it won't fit, the diffraction pattern won't fit in your detector and uh, you're not sampling properly. So now how do you make this kind of lens? Uh, well, uh, you, uh, so a typical uh, lens has, uh, is made uh, uh, with uh, Fresnel zone plates. Has um, a, uh, you have a certain uh, wavefront that you want at the lens, and you have a, the, the lens phase that is normally a quadratic phase. And uh, if you ha have decided what illumination you want, you can design your zone plate so that it produces that illumination. So uh, it's not too complicated. You have this wavefront that you want, uh, and uh, how do you make uh, that wavefront? So if you take the, uh, the efficiency or the amplitude of, a, of um, the scattering from a, uh, from a grating, it, it goes like something, it, the first order is just, uh, if you have bigger line, if you have a full line, you basically block the entire beam. If you have a, uh, the line to line to period ratio will uh, set the, the amplitude that is transmitted. But uh, if you have a, if you look at higher order, first order, it goes as the uh, the sign of the of this function. So uh, what you can do is just more locally you modify the the line with. And the and the and the shift of the zone so that it matches what you want. So uh, you just simply invert that. Uh, fi find this uh, term that will determine the the amplitude of the diffraction part from that region of the zone plate, and uh, uh, and make a zone plate that way. So, for example, you can do uh, holography with a. If you want to do holography with a pinhole reference, you need to have a, an illumination that has a, pin, a spot on one side and a, re, a bigger region on the other side. Or you can put like, a, with a, if you do holography with a coded aperture next to it, uh, then uh, you have to create an illumination with a coded aperture here. So, uh, so these are examples of of illumination, computed illuminations that if you look inside in the focal spot, there is a large area that will illuminate your sample and a small spot, bright spot, that will create your reference when you do holography. Also, you can create an illumination with any, any arbitrary thing you want. It's, you lose in efficiency, but uh, that's not so bad. Now, making these zone plates is really not that simple. I, I went to, this is, like uh, in Saktinawad's lab where I worked for a bit. Uh, well, I didn't work in the lab, but uh, I worked with them. Uh, so you have this big facility that has, uh, I don't know how many, uh, 3,000 square feet of uh, a clean room with uh, all sorts of expensive equipment. And uh, you can, uh, uh, they were able to create this uh, kind of very specific uh, pattern to create a, a zone plate. Then uh, I changed job, so I, we, never, we haven't tried it. And uh, so I'm just gonna leave the list of papers for you and thank you for your attention.